I'm going to be making this PowerPoint presentation, which I'm going to use here, freely available to you for downloading. So all you need to do is write me at Elijah003 at gmail.com, and I will make this PowerPoint available to you. All right. And there's our website. In our website, you will find everything imaginable related to what we have done. Uh, testimonies, articles, videos, uh, audio presentations, PowerPoints, everything is there if you want to look into it. Okay. Okay, without further ado, let's dive into the teaching. Anyone need any more time? No. Here we go. Okay. The Great Commission. All of us are familiar with this, and here it is from Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, Jesus gave us this great commission 2,000 years ago. If we look around at what is happening in the world today, does it seem like we are close to making disciples of all nations? You look around at the world today. Does it seem like we're about to fulfill the Great Commission? And I think we have the impression that the answer is no. Okay. For example, just look at the resurgence of Islam around the world today. We are told that there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the world today, and their plan is to convert us to Islam. Okay, we're supposed to make disciples of all nations. But look what's happening in the world. They want to convert, convert us to Islam. All right? So some might even argue that we are, seem to be losing ground rather than getting closer and closer to fulfilling the Great Commission by making disciples of all nations. So the question is, what went wrong? Okay? We're going to examine this issue. We're no longer going to sweep it under the rug, but we're going to look at this very painful situation. We will look at one of the primary reasons for the failure of the church to fulfill the Great Commission even after 2,000 years. That's a long time. We haven't gotten the job done and we seem to be losing ground, perhaps. Now, to make disciples, we must first preach the gospel to the lost, correct? Part of the Great Commission is making disciples of all nations and as a first step, what do we do? We preach the gospel to the lost, just as Jesus did and as he taught and commanded his disciples. That's what we should be doing, preaching the gospel to the lost. As you know, he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to all creation. That's the first step in making disciples. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons they will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. All right, that's what Jesus said to the early disciples. And that's exactly what happened. Because of the many miracles which accomplished, accompanied the preaching of the gospel in the book of Acts, the word of God spread rapidly through the known world at that time. Correct? That's what happened in the book of Acts. But do we generally see such miracles taking place today when we preach the gospel here or on the mission field? Do we generally see what we see in the book of Acts on the mission field today? And the answer is no, all right? In fact, when we try to minister healing to the sick or cast out demons today when sharing the gospel with the lost, we generally do not see the sick miraculously healed as we see in the book of Acts. We should be seeing it, correct? But we're not seeing it, all right? Actually, we usually do not even try to do what we see in the book of Acts, okay? Typically, when a missionary goes overseas, what do they do? Yeah, they share the gospel, they bring food, they do this, they build an orphanage, they do good works. But they generally do not even try to heal the sick as we see done in the book of Acts. Okay. Now, why is that? Why is that? Something is missing here, correct? Let's examine this matter. 
No longer are we going to sweep it under the rug as we have been doing for centuries, if not thousands of years. Okay. Well, when the sick are not healed, we will typically cite reasons including it's not the will of God or the sick person lacks faith or even I don't have the gift of healing. All right, those are typical explanations to explain why the sick are not healed when we minister to them. Okay, and you're all familiar with those reasons, of course. All right. Uh, did Jesus cite those reasons in the Gospels? And the answer, of course, is no. The sick he ministered to were generally all healed, and so no explanations or excuses were necessary. Right? Okay. So, uh, where could the problem lie? All right. Now, let's focus on how we usually minister to the sick today. Okay? How we, let's say, Assemblies of God, how do we usually minister to the sick today? Okay? And uh, let me show you how I used to do it myself. Okay? I'm going to give you four ingredients that are usually involved when we're ministering to the sick. Of course, there's prayer right? Prayer for the sick. Oh, Father, this person is suffering. Please stretch forth your hand and heal, oh God, okay? And also, I would say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God, hallelujah. Thank you, Father. All right? And of course, if you happen to be a charismatic, you'll throw in some tongues, correct? Uh, okay? You'll speak in tongues, uh, and some of you might even dare to do the following, Father, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke this infirmity and command healing, okay? At least I used to do those things, okay? And I'm sure that many of you also do these things when you're ministering to the sick. All right, okay? Now, according to John 14, 12, we will do the works that Jesus did, correct? There it is, John 14, 12. Jesus said, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And you know I left out the part where it talks about greater works. Let's not worry about the greater works yet. Let's just do the works that he did and then we'll worry about the greater works, okay? So according to verse 12, we're going to do what he did. Now, what works did Jesus do? Well, you know, we, we know he, he fed the hungry, he multiplied food, yes, okay. But primarily, he preached the gospel, he healed the sick, he cast out demons, he made disciples, okay. okay that was his primary work, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out devils, making disciples. Now, does John fourteen twelve mean that we should do the works in the same way that Jesus did them? Does John fourteen twelve teach us that we should heal the sick in the way that Jesus did? Does it teach that we should cast out demons in the way that Jesus did? Well, in order to answer this question, let's look at an illustration. When we learn to perform an important skill from an expert instructor, like using a deadly firearm, should we just do it in just any way we feel like? Or should we do it in exactly the way that our instructor does it. You get my point here, okay? You're using, learning to use a deadly weapon, all right? And you better learn to do it exactly the way your instructor does, because if you don't, there could be danger, all right? And here, we're talking about healing the sick and casting out demons. It is a weapon to be used against the forces of darkness. It is a weapon. So, should we use this weapon in any way we please? Should we do it the way Reverend so-and-so does on TV? Or should we do it the way Jesus did it in the Gospels? Got my point here? Okay. So, let's examine exactly how Jesus ministered healing to the sick. All right? Which, of course, was for the purpose of proving to the lost that he was, in fact, the Christ, the Son of God. All right? I want to emphasize the purpose for which Jesus performed miracles. It was primarily for showing the lost that he was in fact the promised Messiah, 
that he had authority to forgive sins and grant eternal life, that he was in fact the only way to the Father. Okay, that was the primary purpose of his miracles. It was not primarily for ministering healing to believers. There weren't, weren't any believers when he came, all right? The miracles he performed were for the lost so that they could believe on him as the Messiah. You got me? Okay. So although all of you here, of course, are believers and some of you need healing, that's fine. But the primary purpose of this is not for ministering to sick believers, but for showing the lost, especially the gospel-resistant people groups, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, idol worshipers, those who practice witchcraft. It's meant for winning them to Jesus Christ, because unless they see miracles, you're going to have a tough time bringing them to Jesus Christ. Okay? And so... We should minister healing to the sick in exactly the same way for the sake of the gospel to the lost. Okay? Would you agree? We should do it the way Jesus did. Not the way Reverend so-and-so. You know, as big as his church is, uh, as many thousands of people go to his crusades as, as there are, do we follow Reverend so-and-so or do we follow Jesus? We follow Jesus. Okay? John 20, verse 30. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So we know that Jesus performed many miracles, and I believe that most of them were of the nature of miraculous healings. All right? Now, what was the primary purpose of these miraculous healings? Verse 31. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is why all of those miracles were recorded in that book, so that people would believe on Jesus as the Messiah, thereby receiving eternal life, all right? So you see, the purpose of this training is actually reaching the lost. It's not simply ministering to sick believers, which we will do, but it is for winning the lost, especially the gospel resistant, okay? And we have experience in those areas, reaching the most difficult people groups on earth, okay? Now, Jesus Christ, he had three offices. He was a priest, he was a prophet, and he was a king. They are, these are his three acknowledged offices. Now, of course, Jesus is no longer here. He's at the right hand of the Father in heaven, but he has left behind on earth the body of Christ, the church, that's us, and we have these same three offices. We have a priestly office, we have a prophetic office, and we have a kingly office, just like Jesus did. Okay? Now, what do we do as New Testament priests? Well, we offer various sacrifices to God. In the Old Testament, a priest would offer blood sacrifices, the fruit of the land, and so forth, to God. Uh, Jesus has fulfilled those sacrifices. Today we no longer offer blood sacrifices, but we offer spiritual sacrifices to the Lord, like praise, like uh, thanksgiving, like adoration, prayer, intercession, supplication. Whenever you offer something to the Lord, you are moving in a priestly office, okay? Whether prayer, adoration, praise, thanksgiving, all of these things are sacrifices. Prayer is a, it's like incense, that we sacrifice to the Lord, okay? So whenever you offer something to the Lord, that's a priestly action. Now, what do we do as New Testament prophets? Well, in the prophetic office, we're not offering anything to the Lord, but we are offering something to each other to build one another up, okay? Whether a prophecy or a word of instruction, Whenever we offer something to each other, that is a prophetic action. We are building up the body of Christ, edifying, all right, encouraging the prophetic office. The direction is horizontal to each other. But I am here to teach you about the third and final office, which the church has neglected, which the church does not understand. I am talking about the kingly office, okay? I'm sure... You understand about the priestly. In fact, you have spent, I don't know how many days in a row, performing priestly actions, praying to God and worshiping him. And that's wonderful. That's preparation. And of course, uh, I heard you recently had a prophet here who was very powerful, and he ministered to you. Every one of you received the prophecy, okay? But I'm here to teach you about the kingly office, 
which is not that well known to the church. Now, I'm sure the kingly office is very broad. People have written, written books on it, but we are going to focus on the restoration of a particular narrow aspect of the kingly office to the church during these last days. The kingly office uses authority for the purpose of enforcing the rule of the king. What does a king have that someone who was not a king does not have? Authority, all right? King has authority. How does, it get, how does a king get things done? Does he have to do everything by himself? No, he gives commands to his subjects and because they are under his authority, they obey and they get the job done. Okay? So a king gets things done by issuing commands, by exercising authority. We're going to learn about authority. Uh, the kingly office can be for war and for destroying the works of the enemy. For example, King David in the Old Testament, he was a man of war. Uh, after he was anointed to become king, he led the Israelites in battles to drive out the Canaanites from the promised land. Okay, why did he do that? It was so that the kingdom of God could be established in Israel. All right, and it was through the kingly office that is David leading his men to fight battles, driving out the local people, that the kingdom of God eventually was established in Israel. All right, and we are talking about this type of war to establish the kingdom of God here on earth, all right? Here are some characteristics of the kingly office. Kings have authority to command. Kings do not ask. They don't ask nicely, they don't beg. They simply give commands. Kings, true kings, are bold and fearless, like King David. You recall how he faced Goliath. Remember when all of the other Israelites turned their tails and fled in fear from Goliath? What did David do? He advanced against him and said, I'm gonna cut off your head and give your body to the beasts of the air and the birds of the air and everyone will know there is a God in Israel. That's a true king, okay? Fearless and bold. And kings have actual power to, to destroy enemies or the works of the enemy. David, he had armies equipped with deadly weapons, swords, spears, and arrows by which he could destroy enemy armies. Now, I am not talking about military power, of course. I'm not talking about jihad, but I am talking about power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons, destroying the works of the enemy, thus proving to the lost that our God is the only true God and that Jesus is the only way to him. I am talking about that kind of power, all right? Going back to John 14, 12, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. So exactly how did Jesus minister healing to the sick and the oppressed? Let's find out. Are you ready? Okay. We're going to find out how Jesus did it and compare it to how we do it. All right. Luke 4, verse 31. Then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. All right. The people were astonished when Jesus taught. Why? Because his word was with authority. That's the key word there, authority. Let's find out what kind of authority Jesus had and how did he exercise it. Okay. Verse 33. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon and he cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? All right, while Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, a man there becomes demonized and he begins to manifest and create a scene. Okay, maybe he's growling, he's foaming at the mouth and his face is contorted, all right? Now, before we look at how Jesus handled this situation, let me ask a question. What might a typical believer do in such a situation, okay. <laughs> um, 
not a typical believer here, but in, in some other church, okay? Some other church, okay? Let's be honest. Um, some would get up and run. Do, do you agree? Okay. Not, not this church, but the church down the road, okay? If, let's say on a Sunday morning, uh, th there's a person deep into witchcraft, okay? And uh, the person wants to know something about Jesus for some strange reason. Maybe, uh, maybe her grandmother was a Christian, but now she's deep into witchcraft, and, and she feels she wants to learn about Jesus, so she goes to church on a Sunday morning, uh, your typical evangelical church down the road, all right? And it happens that the pastor is teaching about the blood of Jesus on that Sunday morning. And when the pastor says the blood of Jesus, suddenly this witch, guess what, starts to manifest, shake and growl and <laughs> like this, okay? And the typical believer is sitting right next to this manifestation. I don't think this would be surprising for that Christian to get up and run, okay? Because they've never seen it before in their entire lives. They don't know what to do, okay? Or they might say, Pastor, look at this, Pastor, help, okay? All right. But we know that getting up and running is not very spiritual, right? If anything, we know that we're supposed to do something spiritual, okay? Christians got to be spiritual, right? So what action would be spiritual? Well, obviously, prayer, right? That's the most spiritual thing you can do is pray, okay? And if you happen to be of a charismatic persuasion, when you pray, you might pray in tongues, right? Okay, right? Yeah, agreed, okay. And some of you might do the following, Father, in the name of Jesus, we command this demon to come out. Okay, some of you who are really on the ball would do this last one, okay? Okay, fine, we have four uh, possible actions to this scenario. Now, what might a scripturally well-trained believer do? And the answer is, he or she would do exactly what Jesus did. Would you agree? Yes. If you are well-trained, according to scripture, you would do exactly what Jesus did. Okay? So let's find out exactly what Jesus did. You ready? All right. Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. Let me ask a few questions. Did Jesus pray earnestly for him? Did Jesus pray earnestly for him? No. I'm not saying Jesus never prayed, but is he praying here? No. Prayer is speaking to God. Is Jesus speaking to God? No. He's speaking to the demon. So he's not praying. He's speaking to the enemy. If you're speaking to the enemy, you couldn't possibly be praying, right? Okay. All right. And what is he doing to the enemy? He's rebuking the enemy and commanding him to shut up and come out. Okay. Is Jesus being nice? Is he being meek and gentle and patient? No. He's mean and nasty, as he should be to the enemy. Okay, rebuke means mean and nasty. Okay, did Jesus say, Father, we command this demon to be quiet and to come out of him? Did he address his father first? Uh, no. Do you think Jesus closed his eyes? Closing your eyes is the most spiritual thing you can do on earth because when you close your eyes, God shows up magically. I know that's not in the Bible, but that's the impression you get when you've been going to church for 30 years, right? You know. Do you think he closed his eyes? No. Why not? Because he's not praying. If you're praying, you're free to close your eyes, right? If you want. You don't have to, but if you want, you can close your eyes. But here he is not praying to the Father. He is rebuking an enemy. When you rebuke an enemy, should you close your eyes? Never, never. It's a dumb thing to do, all right? You follow me? When you're confronting an enemy, you never close your eyes. Okay. Uh, was there any praise or thanksgiving or hallelujahs directed to the Father? No. 
So was there any priestly action at all directed to the Father? Anything? Prayer? Praise? Thanksgiving? How about a song or a dance? No. No, nothing directed to the Father. It was completely directed to the enemy. It was a kingly action directed to the enemy. How do we know it was kingly? Because he issued a command. Be quiet and get out. Only kings have authority to issue commands, right? So this is clearly a kingly action directed to the demon. There is no priestly action at all directed up to the father. It was completely directed toward this demon. And what was the result of this action? When the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Now, a miracle took place. The man was set free. All right, how did Jesus do this miracle? Was it through prayer? No. He did the miracle by exercising the authority given to him by his father. When the Holy Spirit came upon him at the Jordan River, he received from his father authority over demons. And authority, or exousia in the Greek, is not exercised by praying to God, but rather by issuing a command to that which is under your authority. Y'all get that? It's a very simple concept. Authority is not exercised by praying to God but by issuing a direct command to whatever is under your authority. Let me give you a very, very simple example. How many of you uh, have a pet dog at home? I suspect at least half of you or more, okay? All right, okay. Now, who has the authority, you or your dog? Or let's say who should have the authority? Who should have the authority, you or your dog? You should have the authority. If you don't, whose fault is it? The dog's fault or your fault? Come on. Yeah, it's our fault if we don't have authority over our dog. We should because we are the master. The dog is our pet. All right? So let's say you have a dog who is under your authority and you want him to sit. How would you make him sit? Would you pray to Jesus? Jesus, hallelujah, nothing is impossible for you, Lord, I love you. Lord, I need you to help me make my dog sit. Nothing is impossible for you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Jesus, help me make my dog sit, Lord. I give you the glory in advance right now, hallelujah. And I will wait upon you until you answer my prayer. Okay. Real spiritual, right? We can get real spiritual as needed. But do you think Jesus is going to answer your prayer, even though it is so spiritual? And the answer is no. No? Doesn't he promise to answer our prayers? Doesn't he love us? Why doesn't he answer such a prayer? Because he has given you authority over your dog. You want him to sit. You tell him to sit, right? Do you need to say, Father, I command you to sit? Do you have to do that? Come on. No. no. Should you close your eyes? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Sit. Do you need to close your eyes and throw up a few hallelujahs? Yes or no? No. How about in a song or a dance first before telling him to sit? Necessary? Oh. Did that hurt? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Jesus didn't do any of those things. Excuse me. We don't do any of those things when we want our dog to sit. We just look at him and say, sit. And he better sit. And if he doesn't sit, I'm going to be ticked off. And I'll make him sit because I'm bigger than he is. Okay. That's how you treat those things which are under your authority. Okay? You don't have to get so spiritual. Just give the command. All right? What was the result of this? They were all amazed. These people were amazed when they saw what Jesus did. And we will find out why in a moment. And they spoke among themselves saying, what a word this is. Okay, what word did Jesus say? Be quiet. 
sit? No. <laughs> Jesus said, be quiet and come out of him. All right? Now, why were they so amazed at what Jesus said? Because they realized that this man had authority and power like no other man before him. Because he had God-like authority and power over demons, he could simply command them and they would obey, they would come out. You see, before Jesus arrived on the scene, if such a thing had happened, if someone had gotten demonized, the only course of action they could take would be to pray and ask God for mercy, right? Because only God has authority over demons. We don't, but God does, so we pray to God and ask him to help. But Jesus did not pray. He simply spoke a word, be quiet and come out of him. He just issued a command and the demons obeyed. So they realized, hey, this Jesus has authority and power like God, such that he can issue commands to unclean spirits and they obey him. You see why they were amazed? He didn't pray. He didn't pray. He just gave commands. Therefore, they knew he has authority and power like God. All right? Because Jesus was given authority over demons by his father, he did not need to pray and ask the father to heal the demonized. He himself simply gave commands to the demons, ordering them to leave. Authority is not exercised by praying to God but rather by issuing commands to that which is under our authority. Okay? Issuing commands to that which is under our authority. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't praise God. I'm not saying we shouldn't sing and dance before him. There's a time and place for such things. Speaking in tongues, praising God, prayer. But when you are faced with the enemy, that is not the time for those things. When you are confronted with the enemy, you shoot him between the eyes with authority. Okay? There is a time for the priestly office, worship, prayer, praise. There's a time for that. That's what you've been doing for five nights in a row. All right? But when you are faced with the enemy, that's the time to take out your weapon. That's what we call the kingly office. And fire your weapon to destroy the work of the enemy. Okay? And the church has not been taught the difference between the priestly and the kingly, okay? Now, we're not saying that Jesus never prayed. Of course he prayed. Sometimes he'd pray all night. He prayed a lot, okay? But there were specific occasions on which he did not pray, but rather issued commands. If we are going to do the works that Jesus did, we must learn when we should command and when we should pray. We have never been taught when to pray and when to command. Sometimes when we should be praying, we're commanding. And when, should, when we should be commanding, we're praying. That's why we're not seeing much. And usually we're not taught to command at all, but we are taught to pray, which is fine. We do need to pray, of course. But what is lacking is we have not been taught this dimension of authority. And how do you exercise authority? By issuing a command to that which is under your authority. Verse 37, and the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. And so the name of Jesus began to spread because of the miracles that he was doing. Okay? And this is why we want to learn to perform these miracles so the name of Jesus can spread so that people will believe on him. And so we see how Jesus dealt with a demon. And it makes sense because demons are intelligent. Uh, they have no physical bodies, but they're intelligent. And so when you rebuke them, at some level they hear, they understand, and they obey, okay, because they're intelligent. So it makes sense. But how did Jesus deal with their purely physical infirmity where there was no demon involved? Now, we have been taught that we believers have authority to cast demons out of afflicted people. Yes, we know that. But if someone has a purely physical infirmity, that's very, very different. We can only pray for him and trust God to heal him. And this is 
how our thinking goes. Let's say someone has a fever. They're just plain sick. There's no demon involved. They have a bad fever. Can you uh, talk to the fever? Can you tell the fever to go? Is it going to understand you? And according to that mode of thinking, we say it makes no sense to tell the fever to go because the fever is not intelligent. It's just a physical manifestation of bacteria or a virus. So how can you rebuke the fever? No. In the case of a purely physical infirmity, all we can do is pray and ask God to heal them. Okay. Now that's how we are uh, taught. Maybe not outrightly, but that's kind of the... Um, assumption by which we minister okay let's see how jesus dealt with a purely physical infirmity all right verse 38 jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of simon simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever they asked jesus to help her okay uh, peter's mother-in-law she's not demonized she's just sick she's got a bad fever they asked jesus to help her let's see how jesus helps her are you ready for this? Okay. He bent over her and rebuked the fever. And it left her. Hmm. Okay. A couple of questions here. Did Jesus pray gently and compassionately for her? Did he pray? Come on. No. no. He's not talking to his father. What's he doing? He's speaking directly to the fever and rebuking the fever, just like he rebuked the demon earlier. It's the same action, rebuke. Did Jesus say, Father, we rebuke this fever? Did he address his father first? Mm, no. Do we do that? Mm, yes. <laughs> Do you think Jesus closed his eyes? I mean, when you, when you pray for the sick, you got to close your eyes, right? But is he actually praying for her? He's not praying for her. He's rebuking the fever, rebuking this enemy called a fever. And so he didn't close his eyes, right? You agree? He didn't close his eyes. He's commanding the... How did he rebuke the fever? What is he saying? The scripture doesn't exactly tell us, but I believe he said something similar to what he said to the demon. He probably said something like, go, leave, because that's what he said to the demon when he rebuked it. And so I believe that's what he said to this fever when he rebuked it. Go, leave. Okay. If someone, if someone breaks into your home, okay, and you say, leave my house, do you close your eyes? Get out of my house. Do you close your eyes? No. Okay. It, 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 you get what I'm trying to, to get at. Okay. All right. These are very obvious things, but they have been not been taught in the church. Very obvious things. But we get so spiritual that sometimes we have no earthly good, if you know what I mean. Okay. Uh, was there any praise or thanksgiving or dancing directed to the Father before this miracle took place? No. Okay, no priestly action at all directed up to the Father. Okay, so Jesus is ministering in a way very different from the way we do. Okay, I think you've noticed that by now. Now, one more question here, and this one is quite relevant. Do you think Jesus is using the gift of healing? Do you think that Jesus is using the gift of healing here? Because he's healing Peter's mother-in-law. So you think this is a, the gift of healing? And I hear some of you saying no, and I believe that's the right answer. And I'll tell you why. Okay. We see that Jesus rebuked the fever just as he had rebuked the demon earlier with authority and power. Okay. This is what Jesus did in the synagogue for the man who had the demon. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. And the people were amazed for with authority and power, he commands the unclean spirits and they come out. So for this man, Jesus rebuked the demon with authority and power, correct? He rebuked the demon with authority and power. Now, 
for Peter's mother-in-law, he's doing the same thing. He's rebuking with what? Power and authority. He's doing the same thing, using authority and power, okay? So therefore, Jesus was not using the gift of healing here, but rather authority and power over physical infirmities to heal Peter's mother-in-law. He's not using the gift of healing. Actually, where is the gift of healing mentioned in the New Testament? Someone tell me. Where do we find it? The gift of healing. Who taught about it? What chapter? What book? It's an epistle of the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul teaches about the nine supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit. Correct? Okay. Now, before we go more deeply into this, which we will do a bit later, another question. When was the gift of healing first available on earth? When was the gift of healing first available on earth? Think about this. The gift of healing is from whom? The Holy Spirit. Ah, so when was the gift of healing first available? Beginning on the day of what? Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, he brought the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, including, of course, baptism of the Holy Spirit, yes. And so the gift of healing was available at the very earliest on the day of Pentecost, right? So could Jesus have been using the gift of healing in the Gospels before the day of Pentecost? I don't think so. He was using power and authority, which are distinct from the gift of healing. So which came first, the gift of healing or authority and power over infirmities? Authority and power came first, well before the day of Pentecost, well before the gift of healing. Uh, and I will reinforce this later from Luke chapter 9. Therefore, authority and power are very different from the gift of healing. All right? I want to establish that. Do not confuse the two. They are different in purpose, in function, in operation, and in the time in which they were given. We will go into this in a few moments. Now, and so the Father had given Jesus authority over both demons and physical infirmities. When the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at the Jordan River, he received authority over both demons and physical infirmities. They're not the same. Demons and physical infirmities are different but Jesus had authority over both. So he could issue commands to both and both would submit to him. It's just like uh, you have a dog at home, he's under your authority, you can command him to sit. You may also have little children at home who are still under your authority and you can give them orders, you know, sit down and eat your, your oatmeal, Bobby, and he must sit down and obey. So, so Bobby, you can give commands to Bobby, you can give commands to Fido, your dog. Are they the same? They're very different. One is your dog, the other is your son, okay? But they're both under your authority, so you can give commands to both. Follow me? Whatever is under your authority, you can issue commands to and expect them to obey. So therefore, Jesus could issue commands to both, to both physical infirmities and demons. Both are under his authority. Now, let's look at something else Jesus often did when he healed the sick. Luke 4, verse 40, when the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Okay, often Jesus would physically touch the sick, lay hands on the sick in order to heal them. Why? What was happening when he made physical contact? Well, to learn more about this, we look at Luke 6, verse 19. And the people, meaning the sick people, all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. All right. When the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus at the Jordan River, the Father gave him healing power. Dunamis in Greek, healing power. All right. And that healing power was resident in his body. That dunamis, the healing power. And when he laid hands on the infirm, the healing power flowed into them to heal them. And when some sick people with great faith touched him, 
that healing power would flow into them to heal them. Okay? That's why Jesus often would lay hands on the sick for the healing power to flow into the sick person. You remember with the woman with the bleeding in Mark 5? She came up behind Jesus and touched him. If I just touch him, I will be healed. And when she touched him, Jesus felt power leave him and go into her and she was healed. That's the dunamis, healing power, okay? So that's why Jesus would make physical contact with the sick. But what does this have to do with us? Well, where does Jesus reside at this very moment through the Holy Spirit? Please point to him, someone. Ah, he lives in you right here. Amen. I, I see him. He's right there. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. <laughs> okay. Jesus lives in us. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, correct? All right. He lives in us. You've got treasure in you, brother. Amen. Now, and that is why we disciples can also lay hands on the sick to heal them in accordance with John 14, 12. When you lay hands on them, the healing power of Jesus Christ flows into the sick person to heal them. Okay? And some of you will be able to actually feel this healing power. Some of you probably have felt it already. When you lay hands on the sick, some, when you lay hands on the sick sometimes your hands get hot. Uh, or the person feels something tingling or like electricity. Okay? That's dunamis, the healing power of Jesus Christ flowing from you into the sick person. It's not necessary to feel anything. I never feel anything when I lay hands on the sick. Okay, so it's not a matter of feeling, but the word of God. All right? So often, Jesus placed his hands precisely on or over the physical infirmity in order to be efficient in transferring the healing power to the infirm person. For example, in Mark 7, when Jesus opened the ears of a deaf man, where did Jesus touch him? Do you remember that? Where did Jesus touch him? Fingers into the ears. And he inserted his fingers into the ears so that the healing power would go where? Directly into the ears to open them up. Does it make sense? There's nothing real spiritual about this. Jesus simply wanted to be efficient in transferring the healing power directly to where it was needed. Okay? Remember in Mark 8 when he opened the eyes of a blind man, where did he touch him? On the eyes. Okay, do you see a, a pattern, a principle developing here? Okay. And so often we're going to lay hands on people right where they have the problem. Okay. And so in the case of Jesus, there was no massaging or squeezing or rubbing. You know how when you lay hands on people, you just got to rub them, squeeze them, massage them. You got to help out God. <laughs> do, do you think you're really helping out God when you squeeze or massage the person? Uh, I don't think so. You think Jesus massaged people when he laid hands on them? I don't think so. So just cut out that nonsense, okay? <laughs> cut out the nonsense. It makes you feel good, but... How about some shaking or slapping or tapping or waving in the name of Jesus? Okay. Be healed, be healed, be healed. Uh, you think Jesus is uh, shaking and slapping and tapping? You think Jesus did that? Come on. I don't think so. So just cut it out. It makes you look bad in front of the lost. Okay? Don't get so spiritual. Just, just cut it out. All right? How about pushing? Well, let's just push them down under the floor. Does that mean they're healed when you push them down under the floor? No. But why do we do it? Because we don't know how to heal them, so let's just push them down on the floor. We look good. You know, I, I've been there, I've done that, okay? I know what I'm talking about, all right? How about blowing? You know, now, Jesus did blow on his disciples, but for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Did he ever blow on someone for them to be healed? No, okay? So we just want to do what Jesus did, okay? Maybe it worked for Reverend so-and-so, okay? But I'm not sure if it's going to work for you. Why don't you just do what Jesus did, okay? Okay. So cut out all this funny stuff, all the drama. Cut out all the drama. Just lay hands on them and get the job done. 
be healed in Jesus' name. Now get up and walk. Okay. Luke 5 verse 12, while Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. Uh, this is a physical condition, not necessarily demonic. Let's see how Jesus ministered to him. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Touch. He laid hands on the leper for the healing power to flow. Okay. And then number two, what did he do? I am willing, he said, be clean. Now, is that a prayer? Be clean. Father, be clean. Is, is he praying? Come on. No, he's not praying. To whom or to what is he speaking? He's speaking to the leprosy. He's speaking directly to the infirmity, commanding it to be clean. All right. Did Jesus say, Father, I command this man to be clean? Did he address his father? No. Did he close his eyes? No. Any hallelujahs? Any thank you, Father? Anything like that? No priestly action at all. Zero. Nada. Is Jesus using the gift of healing here? No. He's using power and authority. Okay? He's touching the man in order to transfer healing power, and then he issues the command, be clean. He's doing exactly what he did for Peter's mother-in-law, using power and authority. He is not using the gift of healing. Okay? And immediately the leprosy left him. Can you say the leprosy at some level heard and obeyed the command? Yeah, at some level. It heard, it understood, it obeyed immediately, immediately, immediately. That's the nature of authority. Whatever is under your authority must obey you immediately. Okay? Matthew 12, verse 9. Going on from that place, he went into their synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Verse 13, then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Is that a heartfelt prayer to the father? Stretch out your hand. Father, stretch out your hand to heal this poor guy. Is he praying? No. To whom is he speaking? Directly to the man with the shriveled hand. Stretch out your hand. He's not praying. Did he say, Father, we command this man to stretch out his hand? No. Did he close his eyes? No. Any priestly action? No. Is he using the gift of healing? No. He's still using authority. Stretch out your hand. Okay. What was the result? So he stretched it out and it was completely restored, just as sound as the other. These miracles are happening today. There is a Canadian missionary named Jim Hathaway who came to our hometown of Houston in 2008 and he came to our advanced training and after that he took off and he began to go on mission trips to the Philippines and in his open air crusades people with severe strokes would come, okay? Not walking in wheelchairs, that's how severe their strokes were, okay? And it seemed like the Lord has given him special authority in this area because he would just go up to them and just do what Jesus did. Get up out of your wheelchair. And the person would get up, okay? And then he would say, stretch out your hand. And he would see like that. He described it as a flower blossoming up, blossoming, opening up like a blossom, okay? I don't see too many of those, but people I have trained have seen miracles like that. These things are happening today. All right. Now, and so we see that this authority and power over disease is very distinct from the gift of healing. Okay. Can you buy that? Can you buy that? Okay. To reinforce that, I'm going to give you four major differences between authority and power and the gift of healing. Some of them we've gone over already, but I just want to list them for you in a formal fashion. The first difference is difference in time. 
authority and power to heal was given before the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. Uh, I will show you this. I will give you the verse a bit later, but I want to give you this first. Even in the Gospels, Jesus was already operating with authority and power, correct? And the gift of healing was not available until the day of Pentecost, correct? So even in the case of Jesus, authority and power, just looking at the case of Jesus, I should say, the authority and power came well before the day of Pentecost, which was the earliest time when the gift of healing was available, okay? Difference in time. Authority and power came first. Second difference, difference in frequency. Every believer is given this authority according to John 14, 12, while not every believer was given the gift of healing. And we will look at this also in more detail. Does, does everyone have the gift of healing? No. But I, I submit to you that every believer has a measure of this power and authority because Christ lives in you and you are a witness of Christ to the nations. And he has given you this weapon so that you may preach the gospel accompanied by miraculous signs confirming the truth of the gospel. Okay. Third difference, difference in operation. The operation of the authority to heal is very different from the operation of the gift of healing. How does the authority to operate? Always by issuing a command. That's how you exercise authority, right? You give an order, you give a command to whatever is under your authority. But the gift of healing is not a kingly action. The gift of healing could be a priestly action. It might be through prayer. It might be through worship and praise or speaking in tongues. That could be how the gift of healing operates. It could be a priestly or even a prophetic action, okay? But the authority is always through a kingly action, the issuing of a command, all right? So you wanna to learn to distinguish between the gift of healing and the authority and power to heal. Once you understand that distinction, you'll be much more proficient in healing the sick and you'll know what's going on. Finally, a difference in function. According to 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of healing is for ministry to the church and sick believers, while authority and power over disease and demons, as we shall see in a moment, are given for a very different purpose, okay? Let me give you the verses. Let me give you the verses for this, okay? First, we're gonna look at the gift of healing according to 1 Corinthians 12, and then we're gonna look at power and authority, and we're gonna see that the purpose of each is different, okay? All right, let's look at the gift of healing first. 1 Corinthians 12, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit. Verse seven, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. Now, what did Paul mean by for the common good? For the common good of what? What is the context of 1 Corinthians 12? The body of Christ, correct, okay? And the gifts are for the purpose of building up the body of Christ, correct? Okay, so when it says common good, it means the common good of the church, the body of Christ, okay? Now, okay, let's look at some of these gifts in verse eight, talks about word of wisdom, word of knowledge. Okay, verse eight, verse nine, to another faith by the same spirit and to another gifts of healing by that one spirit. So here we have four of those nine gifts and here we have gifts of healing, okay? Now, gifts of healing according to the context of this chapter are for ministering to whom? The body. In other words, gifts of healing are primarily for ministering to sick believers in the context of building up the body of Christ, correct? That's the primary purpose of the gift of healing, ministering to sick believers. Okay. One more verse, 1 Corinthians 14, 12. So it is for you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. All right, is it clear? Gifts are primarily for building up the church, the body of Christ. Gift of healing, therefore, ministering healing to sick believers. All right, okay, that's abundantly clear. Now, 
power and authority, however, are very different from the gift of healing. Okay, what's the primary purpose of this authority and power? Luke 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the 12 together, 12 disciples, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. For what purpose? He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So what is the primary purpose of this power and authority over disease and demons? For the purpose of what? Preaching the gospel to the lost. Healing the sick as a miraculous sign to the lost that our God is the only true God and that Jesus is the only way to him. And let me tell you, you don't have these signs. You're not going to get too far with Muslims, Buddhists, Buddhists, Hindus, and idol worshipers, okay? And let me tell you, they are right here in your city, correct? Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, okay? Aren't you glad that you don't have to go to India to reach Hindus? They're right here. God has given you the nations. Now go out and get them. They're right here. They can't persecute you, right? This is our land. We're the landlords here. So you can go and preach the gospel to them and they're not going to stone you to death. They're not going to put you in prison. All right? So you have such a wonderful opportunity here for missions. Go after them. They are much easier to reach here than they are over there. Believe me. Believe me. Okay? They have come to America. They're looking for the American dream. Okay, so they're open to the things of America, American culture, okay, American religion, <laughs> all right? You can go after them, but make sure you confirm the preaching of the gospel with miraculous signs because then they know that this Christianity is not simply a Western religion imported by the colonial masters, but it is actually the way, the truth, and the life, okay? For Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims, most of them think of Christianity as the religion of their conquerors. Do you remember the age of imperialism? Okay, you, you weren't born then, and neither was I, but according to the history books, the British, the French, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the Spanish, they sent out warships and they conquered many nations, okay? And they uh, exploited those nations, and along with Gunboats who came along, missionaries, bringing the religion of the white Europeans called Christianity. So do you think they have a good impression of Christianity? No. Okay. So you got to show them Christianity is more than just a European religion. It is the way, the truth, and the life. And the way you do that is through miraculous signs that their gods cannot do. And so the primary purpose of this power and authority over diseases and demons is for demonstrating to the lost, through the miraculous, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Okay? By the way, this will also work for Joe Sixpack living next to you, who's got, you know, some, some problem, physical problem. Doctors can't help. Do you think if he's healed, he might want to believe in Jesus? Why not? <laughs> okay. But... You see, if you can reach the most gospel resistant with this, how about the, the ones that are easier to reach? You follow me? Okay. Like Joe Sixpack next door. Okay. Our task in the Elijah Challenge is to teach disciples to minister healing in this very context of proclaiming the gospel to the lost. Okay. That's the purpose of this training. And that is exactly the same context in which Jesus and his early disciples ministered. When Jesus came 2,000 years ago, did he come to minister to believers to build up the church? No, there weren't any believers. There was no church. He came to save the lost. And that's why he performed miracles, to save the lost. And that's the primary purpose for us. We want to learn to do these miracles in order to save the lost, period. Okay. Now, you can also use it for ministering to believers. It does work, and that's fine. That's great. Okay. But for me, the greater priority is the Great Commission, okay? Preaching the gospel to all creation. Let's go back to this one again. Whoever believes in Jesus will do the works that he has been doing. 
Therefore, we should be ministering to the sick and demonized exactly as Jesus and his disciples did. Okay. And up until now, are we ministering to the sick and demonized as Jesus did in the Gospels? And the answer is no. Okay. We've been following traditions. And as you know, and as you have experienced, the sick are usually not healed. And now you know why. Because we're not doing it the way Jesus did. As simple as that. Okay. Now, as we have already seen, the Bible specifically teaches that Jesus gave to his disciples power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons when he sent them out to preach the gospel. Let's look at this verse again. Luke 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Does that say heal the sick or pray for the sick? Someone tell me. I forgot to bring my eyeglasses. Okay. What does that say? Heal the sick or pray for the sick? Heal the sick. Hmm. Are we doing that? Are we healing the sick or praying for the sick? We're praying for the sick. Oh. Do you think that's the reason why miracles are not happening? Because we're not healing them? We're just praying for them? Is that possible? Is that possible? <laughs> we're going to examine this. What, what does healing, what does it mean to heal the sick? It means doing exactly what Jesus did, right? Correct? That's what Jesus did, heal the sick. And so when we are to heal the sick, we should do exactly what Jesus did. That means performing miracles. Sick people are actually healed on the spot. There's no claiming or all this, not, I shouldn't say nonsense, but <laughs> there, there's no claiming in all of this. We're just getting the job done. The person is healed. <laughs> End of story, okay? Now, Jesus did not command his disciples to pray for the sick when he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God. There is no such command in any of the four Gospels. Let me repeat that. Jesus never told his disciples to pray for the sick in any of the four Gospels. It is not there. I'm not saying you shouldn't pray for the sick. Don't get me wrong. But Jesus never commanded us to pray for the sick. I know why you do because of John, excuse me, James chapter 5, which I will go into on Sunday. Okay. And I think I'm going to give you something that you've never heard before with regard to what James meant when he said pray over the sick. Okay. Rather, he commanded them to heal the sick as he did. All right. So why is it that most believers today would rather pray for the sick instead of heal the sick? Let's address this very uncomfortable question, okay? What's the difference between praying for the sick and healing the sick as Jesus did and as he commanded us to do? What's the difference? Which one is easier and less risky, especially in front of a crowd of people? Ah, praying for the sick is less risky because you're asking God to heal the sick. You're just ask. All you do is ask. The responsibility for the miracle is completely in his hands. Correct? And so if the person is healed, you say praise God. If the person is not healed, what do we say? It's not God's will. So you haven't failed, right? You don't have to feel bad. You did your part. You asked. And God said no. You know, what can you do? Not my fault. It's God's fault. Okay? But when you heal the sick, especially in front of a crowd of people, meaning performing a miracle as Jesus did, is it possible that you might fail? Have you ever tried to heal the sick as Jesus did and nothing happened? Yes. Right? How do you feel when nothing happens? You just feel like disappearing, right? Especially if you're in front of a crowd of people, you know? Imagine you're preaching to 10,000 bloodthirsty Muslims, okay? And one of them 
struggles up from the chair and says, if your Jesus is who he says he is, I want to be healed now. And you go, help me, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's dangerous. Or you think it's dangerous. But once you understand how to heal the sick as Jesus did, it is not dangerous. It is not risky. Okay? I don't know how many times I have done this, how many countries I have done this. The Lord has never failed me. Miracles always take place. And I do not have the gift of healing. I only understand the authority to heal, which all of you have. All right. And so, but humanly speaking, healing the sick, as Jesus did, is risky. Okay, humanly speaking, it's risky. Okay. There's always the possibility of failure. And so, you know, being Americans, you know, we don't want to fail in front of people. So let's just forget this healing business. Let's just pray and trust God to do it according to his good time and his good will. Hallelujah. Okay. Sounds real spiritual. But Jesus never said pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. Yeah. All right. So few servants of God and believers today actually heal the sick as Jesus commanded his disciples. Is that command still valid? Yes, but we're not healing the sick as he commanded. So what should we do about that? What kind of action should we take? Starts with R, E, P, E, N, T. Spells repent, right? We have disobeyed his command, have we not? Jesus says heal the sick. We hardly ever heal the sick. We pray for the sick. We have disobeyed his command. Should we repent of our disobedience? Absolutely. And now learn how to heal the sick as he did. Okay. Verse six, excuse me. Yes. So they set out and went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. They obeyed after receiving this power and authority. They went out from village to village preaching the gospel and were they praying for the sick everywhere come on were they praying for the sick everywhere healing the sick everywhere using this power and authority they were laying hands on the sick and issuing commands and people were actually being healed why is it important to heal people when you are preaching the gospel because they're a single package miraculous healings can open up the heart of the lost to the gospel and bring the backslidden back to the Lord. Do you have any backslidden believers in this city? Many or just a few? Many, a lot, okay. Now, notice that in Luke 9, Jesus gave this power and authority to the 12 apostles. The 12, meaning the big boys, you know, Peter, James, John, the big boys, apostles, okay. Now, what if you're not an apostle? Like. You and me, we're just ordinary believers. Do we have any of this power and authority? Let's see. After this, the Lord appointed 70 others. Now, who are they? Are they apostles? No, these are committed disciples like you and me. And he sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. What does he do? He sends them out, obviously, to preach the kingdom of God to the lost, okay? Now, when he sent them out, did he give them any of this power and authority over demons when he sent them out? Let's find out. We're going to look at what he commanded them to do in verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. What did Jesus command them to do? Heal the sick or pray for the sick? Heal the sick. Heal the sick. Does that mean he actually gave them some power and authority to heal the sick? Absolutely. All right. And so authority over diseases was also given to the 70 disciples who were not apostles when they were sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God. All right. And then verse 17, the 70 returned with joy from their short-term mission trip and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Did Jesus also give them authority over demons? Yes. And so the next mission trip you take south of the border, you're going to do this, right? 
You're going to go into a village and heal the sick. You're going to go into a village and say, all right, every sick person, come out here right now. Holy Spirit lives in you. You have, you've got this boldness. Amen. Uh, you're not chickens. You're eagles, right? Uh, okay. You go to a village and you tell sick people to meet you out uh, the front gate. All right. Uh, and before you even preach the gospel to them, you're going to heal them. You see what Jesus said? Uh, which one came first, the healings or the preaching? The healings came first. Okay. Now, sometimes you may want to preach the gospel first, especially if people have already come, they're ready to listen to the gospel. Fine. You preach the gospel first, and then you can perform the confirming miracles later. But if you're going to go into one of those villages and you're going to say, sick people come, they're going to come to be healed. They're not interested in the gospel. They just want to be healed. And so what you do is you heal them first. And then after they are healed and all of them have testified that they have been healed. And then you say, now, let me tell you why God did these miracles. Stay. Let me tell you the purpose behind all these miracles that you have seen. And you will preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. And now they will listen because they have already seen the miracles. And now they're going to listen to you. And many of them will repent. All right. I've done this before. Okay. Let me share with you. Um, okay. Okay. Maybe I should share with you something, okay? I was in uh, Benin, in West Africa, okay? And Benin is known as the birthplace of voodoo, the birthplace of black magic. It started in the country of Benin. And we had trained uh, a group of servants of God, and we decided we're going to apply what we have learned to preach the gospel in the capital city. It's called Katanu. And we went to the very center of the city. It's called Lenin Plaza, where you have seven major streets converging, okay, like spokes on a wheel, okay. We went right into the middle, Lenin Plaza, and we brought our keyboard and our singers, okay. And so we had our singers sing, accompanied by the uh, keyboard, hoping to draw a crowd of people, okay. Now, this works in a village. It does work in a village in Africa, but this is Katanu, the capital city where the people are more sophisticated. And so people would just walk by and they would look at us, but they would keep on walking. You know, they weren't interested. And so by the time our worshipers stopped singing, I stood up to speak. There was no one in front of me at the plaza. It was completely empty. Okay. So what did, what did I do? I looked around, you know, and I saw at a distance people just sitting around, hanging around, okay? And so I said, is there anyone here who has a sickness or infirmity and you want God to heal you? Raise your hand. And I looked and at a distance I could see people with their hands up, okay? And so I said, if you want God to heal you, come and stand in front of me right now. And so people began to gather right in front of me. Eventually, we got about 75 people. How do you like that? Okay. You like it? You're going to do this, right? Yeah. Excellent. You do this. You can do it. I don't have any special gift. I'm just a preacher of the gospel. That's all. And so before sharing the gospel, I told the trained believers, I said, okay, we have all these sick people. I want you to lay hands on them and heal them as I taught you. Okay. And so they laid hands on them. They exercised authority and bang, 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 bang. People were healed left and right. They came to me and I got their public testimonies. Some of them were quite powerful miracles. There was a boy, homeless boy, everyone knew him, who was deaf and dumb. He was talking and hearing after someone ministered to him. Okay? Okay? And I didn't touch the boy. It was an African believer who had been trained. And then after all of the testimonies, I said, now let me tell you why God did these miracles. And now I had their attention, obviously. I preached the gospel to them and about I guess, 70 of them accepted Jesus Christ right then and there. Okay. You see, you can do this. You can do this. That's what Jesus commanded the 70 to do. You are among the 70 ordinary, committed, nameless, faceless disciples of Jesus Christ. All right. 
do it. So the next time you go on a mission trip, okay, in addition to the worthy things like painting churches and visiting orphans, you're going to heal the sick and tell them the kingdom of God is near you. That's also worthy. Did you know getting people saved is also worthy? Just like painting churches, it's worthy, okay? Am I being sarcastic? No, God forbid. <laughs> All right, God forbid. All right, so what conclusion do we draw here? The 12 were given power and authority over disease and demons when Jesus sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God. The 70 were also given a measure of this power and authority when they were sent out. Notice that when each group was sent out, Jesus gave them this power and authority. So what do we conclude? A measure of authority over disease and demons was given to whomever the Lord sent out to proclaim the kingdom of God to the lost. And who is sent out as a witness? Every disciple is a witness of Jesus Christ to the world, right? All of you are witnesses, and Jesus Christ lives in all of you through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, all of you already have a measure of this power and authority over disease and demons to be used to heal the sick in the context of preaching the gospel to the lost. Amen? Each one of us has a measure of the supernatural power and authority. All right. Now, so why does usually nothing happen when we minister to the sick using authority and power as Jesus did? How come nothing happens? What are we doing wrong? Okay, now we're going to get closer to the truth now. Okay, I'm sure most of you already understood that you have this power and authority and some of you have actually tried to use it, but usually nothing happens. Now, what are we doing wrong here such that miracles are not happening? Okay. Okay, often we will blame the sick person for lacking faith, okay? Uh, we tell the sick person to claim their healing by faith and trust God, okay? But did Jesus often or ever tell infirm people who came to him to simply claim their healing and later they would receive their healing? Did he often do that? No, usually he would just heal them on the spot. He didn't tell them to claim their healing Usually, he would just heal them, and then they would follow him, okay? So Jesus didn't do that. He actually performed the healing, okay? You agree? In most cases, if not all, he would actually perform the healing. Now, of course, we know the following scripture. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Okay. So from this we understand that because of the lack of faith in the people in his hometown, he couldn't do any big miracles there. Okay, so lack of faith does affect the outcome, yes. But note that even with the lack of faith of the hometown people, Jesus was still able to heal a few sick people, right? He was still able to heal a few sick people, even with their lack of faith, okay? So we will see that Jesus instead placed far greater weight on the role of the faith of his disciples in healing the sick miraculously and performing miracles. Jesus placed far greater weight on the faith of his disciples whom he sent out to heal the sick than on the faith of the sick person, okay? This is a very important factor which is not taught in the church today. Typically in the church, if someone is not healed, we say, oh, the sick person lacks faith, okay? But Jesus placed far greater focus on the faith of the disciples who ministered the healing, okay? Let's examine the consequence of little faith in the one who is ministering healing, okay? Now that's you and me, okay? We're talking about those who minister the healing. Let's look at the consequence of little faith, okay? Matthew 17, 14. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. 
Lord, have mercy on my son. He said, he has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. All right. Do you think the father here lacked faith? Doesn't seem like it. Do you think the father fully expected his boy to be healed by the disciples? Yeah. And when his boy was not healed, he was really disappointed and he ran to Jesus to tattle on them, right? Okay. So I don't think the father here was really responsible for the lack of the healing. I don't think so. Okay. Look how Jesus responded when he heard this bad report. Okay. Oh, you unbelieving and perverse generation. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Are those sweet and kind words from our shepherd? I don't think so. He's calling them unbelieving perverts. You know, I'm from Texas and them's fighting words. You know, someone calls you an unbelieving pervert, you know. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? He has lost it. He's lost it, okay? But I thought Jesus was gentle and kind and meek. <laughs> There's a reason for all of this, okay? Now, first of all, did Jesus expect his disciples to be able to heal the boy? Yes. Absolutely. And when he heard that they had failed to heal this boy, he lost it and he rebukes them severely for being unbelieving and perverse. Okay? Now, Jesus' response to the failure of his disciples to perform this miracle could not contrast any greatly with the expectation today in the church for believers to perform miracles. Okay? Let's say, let's say Pastor Nick gets a call from someone in the community. Okay? They don't go to church and they have a sick child and they've uh, heard that Jesus can heal or maybe, maybe he can heal. So, so they call up Pastor Nick and say, please send someone to, to, to pray over, quote unquote, to, to, to do something to heal our child. Uh, if our child is healed, we're gonna go to church this Sunday, okay? This is an opportunity, right? So, so Pastor Nick calls one of you, okay, one of you leaders, and he says, I want you to go there. I want you to lay hands on that boy and heal that boy. Come back to me with a praise report, okay? So you go over there, you visit the family, you go into the bedroom, you lay hands on the boy, and as usual, nothing happens. The boy is still sick in bed, moaning and groaning, no miracle, okay? And so you go back, you come back to church and you report to Pastor Nick. He's waiting for you in the office, okay? And he says to you, give me a praise report, hallelujah. And you say to him, uh, Pastor Nick, do you think I'm Jesus? <laughs> Who do you think I am? The boy is still sick. You got to be patient, Pastor. There's no change yet. You know, let's just continue claiming his healing and maybe next week he'll feel better, okay? Now, would Pastor Nick say to you, you unbelieving and perverse leader, you, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Okay, probably not. But he might change, who knows? <laughs> Jesus did it, so why can't we do it? Okay, all right. Now, of course, you know, there are reasons why Pastor Nick would not say this, okay? But the major one is probably because of our theology. Our theology says only God can perform miracles. We believers are helpless. We can't do anything except pray and trust God. So if a believer tries to heal the sick and nothing happens, that's par for the course. How can you get mad at someone for failing to perform a miracle? Come on, okay? That's... That's our, our theology. That's our assumptions, right? That's why we don't get mad at you for failing to perform miracles. Okay? So how can we understand Jesus here? His expectation is vastly different from the churches in this area, correct? Could not contrast more. Okay? How could Jesus have possibly expected and even demanded his disciples to be able to perform this miracle? It's not reasonable for us at least according to our church traditions, is not reasonable. So 
how do we understand his teaching, which contrasts so sharply with our traditions? Okay. Well, I'm going to give you three reasons, and these three reasons will give you understanding why Jesus was not being unreasonable. First reason, they were his disciples and were being trained to do what he did. What did Jesus do? He went from place to place, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons, teaching the word of God. His disciples were following him and observing him and learning to do what he did. Is that reasonable? They were learning to do what he did. And I'm sure he was teaching them to do what he did. That's why they called him rabbi, teacher. Okay. Number two, he had given them authority to heal the sick and cast out demons, right? Luke 9, Luke 10, he had given them authority to cast out demons. And then he had sent them out and commanded them to heal the sick. Based on those three reasons, was Jesus being reasonable when he just lost it with his disciples when he heard that they had failed? Well, he didn't lose it, but he was very disappointed, let's say. Was he being reasonable when he was so disappointed with his disciples? Yes or no? Obviously, yes, he was reasonable. These are the three reasons why. He had taught them how to heal the sick. He gave them the power and authority to heal the sick. And he had sent them out and commanded them to heal the sick and preach the gospel. So he is now reasonable in expecting them to be able to obey and get the job done. And when they came back in failure, he was disappointed with them. Okay. Now, do you think Jesus expects you and me today to be able to heal the sick successfully, to bring glory to his name and souls to him? Yes or no? Yes. yes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay. All right, bring the boy here to me. Okay. He's clearly ticked off. His disciples can't do it. So he says, all right, bring him to me. I'll take care of it. All right. Jesus rebuked the demon. It came out of the boy and he was healed from that moment. Okay, how did Jesus perform the miracle? Did he pray? No, he rebuked the demon. Do you think the disciples didn't rebuke the demon that, that they just prayed for the boy? Is that why they failed? Think about it. Did Jesus ever teach them to pray for the sick? He never did. So I'm sure the disciples did rebuke the demon, right? They did rebuke the demon, but it wouldn't leave. But when Jesus rebuked the demon, it left. Ah. Verse 19, so the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why couldn't we drive it out? I mean, we, we did what we saw you do. We, we rebuked the demon, but it didn't go. Well, why? What, what did we do wrong? Okay. okay. That's the question to which we need answers. Why is it that we fail to heal the sick? We fail to drive out demons. All right. Now, before we look at the answer which Jesus gave, we want to look at the four reasons that we give to explain why the sick are not healed when we minister to them. Okay? When we minister to the sick, nothing happens. There are four explanations that we give. Number one, we say it's not God's will. Number two, we say it's not God's time. Number three, we say the sick person has sin. And number four is the charismatic favorite, the sick person lacks faith. Okay? Those are the four reasons that we give to explain why people are not healed. Now, I am not saying that these reasons are not valid. They can be valid, all right? Sometimes they might apply. For example, let's say you have a believer in the church who has some sort of physical infirmity. They can't breathe very well, okay? And they come to you and ask you to lay hands on their chest because they can't breathe well. But you happen to know that this believer is still smoking. So you come up to this believer and you say, brother, are you still smoking? And he says, yes, I am. And you say, well, you have to repent of this sin before God can heal you. And he says, shut up and mind your own business. Just lay hands on me and heal me. Do you think God is going to heal him with that kind of attitude? No, he doesn't want to repent. Okay. So some of these reasons can be valid. Okay. I'm not saying they're not valid. No. However, when we say it's not God's will and not God's time, essentially, who are we blaming? Yes, essentially. 
it's, God doesn't want to do it. Problem is God. God's not ready to do it. Problem is God. When we say the sick person has sin, the sick person lacks faith, essentially, who are we blaming? The sick person. How convenient. When the person is not healed, we either blame God or the sick person. Guess who we never blame? We never blame ourselves. Typical human beings, right? Okay. You remember Adam and Eve in the garden? When God approached Adam and said, you know, why did you do this? What did Adam say? What did he say? The woman that you gave me. <laughs> okay. He's blaming God. Well, he's blaming both God and the woman. And when God approached Eve, what did Eve say? The serpent, the serpent that who placed in the garden? <laughs> who allowed to be in the garden? The serpent. Okay, we always want to point the finger somewhere else. I, I get it. It's, that's our, our human nature. Okay. But let's find out. According to Jesus, what was the real reason why the boy was not healed? Let's find out. Are you ready? All right. Verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. You have so little faith. You referring to the disciples. Because of your unbelief. So whose fault was it that the boy was not healed? The disciples. Okay. The disciples, not because it wasn't God's will, not because it wasn't God's time. Was it because the boy had sinned? I'm sure the boy had sinned, but was that the reason why he wasn't healed? No, it was because of the lack of faith in the disciples. Okay. So what we see so far is that these disciples already had power and authority, right? Jesus already gave them power and authority. It was in them. What did they lack? Faith. This kind of faith. Okay. And so we see that two ingredients are necessary if you want to heal the sick effectively. Number one, you need power and authority. And you already have that in you. But what we are missing is something called faith. All right. So let's examine what kind of faith is it that we lack causing us to fail. You ready? Let's repeat verse 20, same chapter. He replied, because you have so little faith. All right, what kind of faith did they lack? Jesus said, I tell you the truth. If you have faith as a mustard seed. Okay. So they lacked faith as a mustard seed. Okay. Not faith as small as a mustard seed as rendered in the NIV. I don't know if any of you are using the NIV, but this is a mistranslation. The Greek does not support faith as small as. It simply says faith as a mustard seed. Let me tell you why, okay? A mustard seed is very little, correct? Yeah. Jesus just rebuked his disciples for having little faith. <laughs> so is it okay? Does it please him when we have faith as small as a mustard seed? No. So he is not focusing on the size of the mustard seed, but rather on another attribute of the seed, the nature of the seed, not the size. All right? Okay, not the size. You don't want faith as small as a mustard seed because you will fail every time. Okay? That's a mistranslation. The King James has it right. If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed. Now, let's go back to verse 20 and continue on. He replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And nothing will be impossible for you. Okay, this is the kind of faith which they were missing. They did not have faith as a mustard seed. They did not have mountain-moving faith. 
if they had mountain moving faith, they could speak directly to a mountain and command it to move from here to there and the mountain would obey and nothing would be impossible for them. The disciples failed because they did not have faith as a mustard seed or mountain moving faith. And that is generally the reason why we fail when we try to heal the sick using authority. If we fail, it is generally because we lack mountain moving faith. We're going to look into the details of this mountain moving faith. Mustard seed faith can move mountains. All right. Now, the next verse, which is verse 21, does not appear in all of the Greek manuscripts in the NIV. It is simply a footnote at the bottom of the page. But let's look at it anyway, verse 21. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. What did Jesus mean by that? He did not mean that this demon is so big and powerful that you don't have a hope of casting it out. Forget it, just fast and pray to me and I'll take care of it. Some people interpret that verse in that way and that is a misinterpretation of the scriptures, okay? In the scripture, we don't see a single instance of a demon being cast out purely by prayer and fasting apart from the issuing of a command. We don't see it there. What did Jesus mean by this? He meant that prayer and fasting increase mountain moving faith in order for you to cast out the demon successfully, okay? The prayer and fasting prepare you to battle, prepare you to issue the command, okay? It increases your faith, all right? That's what the prayer and fasting do. And you have been praying and fasting a lot, all right? And so after this teaching, your faith is going to be great because you have done your part praying and fasting. What I'm doing is just adding the word to this. All right, introducing mountain moving faith, also known as faith as a mustard seed. Okay, now this is going to be the most important passages of this evening, so I really want to get this. This is the key. All right, this is the key. We're going to look at the nature of mountain moving faith. All right, Luke 2, Luke 7, verse 2. There, a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. Okay. So initially, this centurion, this God-fearing Gentile, uh, his servant was dying, and he heard about Jesus, and he asked Jesus to come to his home and heal his servant face to face, okay. maybe through the laying on of hands. Verse six, so Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. Okay. The centurion changed his mind. He uh, remembered that he was a Gentile and Jesus was a Jew and that Jews are not supposed to associate with Gentiles lest they become unclean. So he wanted to honor Jesus. Okay. Don't trouble yourself. I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. But say the word and my servant will be healed. Say the word and my servant will be healed. Did the centurion ask Jesus to pray for his servant? Did he say, oh, please pray for my servant. He's dying. No. Say the word. Say the word and my servant will be healed. Say what word? Hmm? Be healed. Oh, just give the command, even at a distance, and my servant will be healed. Oh, all right. Let's see what kind of understanding the centurion had, which enabled him to say to Jesus, just say the word. Let's see what kind of understanding he had. Verse eight, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. So this man was in the military. He had rank. He was under the authority of his commanding officer, but he had soldiers under him, maybe a hundred soldiers, 
Okay? So he understood the nature of authority. That's how the military runs, okay? Chain of command, okay? I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell them, I tell that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. Did this man have any doubt at all that men under his authority would obey his commands? Any doubt at all? Did he have any doubt at all? How about 10% doubt? 5% doubt? 1% doubt? No, 0% doubt. Why? Because he understood the nature of authority. Whatever is under my authority must obey my commands. Once I say it, it's done. What I say must come to pass because they're under my authority. The centurion understood exactly the nature of authority. Okay, so far so good? All right, now look at Jesus's unusual reaction to his words. Look at this. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. When he heard those words, Jesus was amazed. Okay, what, what were those words? If I tell this one, do it, he does it. I tell my servant, do this, he does it. When Jesus heard those words, he was amazed. Okay, all right. Why? Why? Turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Jesus was amazed at this man's great faith. He did not see anyone even in Israel with the kind of faith that this centurion had. Okay? You, you still with me? He's amazed at this man's faith. How did he know this man had faith? Because he said, when I tell this one, do it, he does it. When I tell my servant, do this, he does it. When he heard those words, he knew this man had great faith that he didn't see in anyone else in Israel. Okay, what kind of great faith did this man have that Jesus did not see even in Israel? Okay, we wanna find out. What was so special about this man's faith that he didn't see anywhere else in Israel? Now, of course, he had faith that Jesus could heal his servant. He had faith in Jesus to heal his servant, okay? This is obvious, right? This is obvious, okay? Got that? Okay. That much is extremely clear. The problem is other people who came to Jesus, like the woman with the bleeding in Mark 5, also had the same kind of faith in Jesus to be healed. Remember Mark 5, the woman with the bleeding? Remember that? If I just touch his cloak, I will be healed. When she touched his cloak, she was healed. And Jesus turned around and said, who touched me? Because he, he knew someone had been healed. He felt the healing power leave him. Who touched me? And finally, the woman came forward and acknowledged what she had done. And what did Jesus say to her? Woman, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Okay. Now, that woman's faith is the same as the centurion's faith here. Okay. Both of them are faith in Jesus for someone to be healed. Right. It's the same kind of thing. Got that? So, but what was special about the faith of this man such that Jesus said, I haven't seen anyone in Israel with his kind of faith. There was another dimension to the faith of the centurion beyond faith in Jesus to heal the servant. Another dimension beyond simply faith for someone to be healed. Because he understood authority, he knew exactly how Jesus could heal his servant at a distance. He knew exactly how Jesus could heal the servant. Jesus could simply say the word, issue a command at a distance, and the infirmity would have to obey and leave. You see, the centurion understood that authority is not affected by distance. You, you, you all get that, right? Okay, 
if you have someone under your authority, like uh, someone works for you, okay? They receive salary from you. Can you call them from home and, and give them an order over your phone? Will they obey you? Absolutely, okay? What if you're, in, uh, you're on a mission trip and halfway around the world, can you call your employee on the phone and, and give them an order, will they obey you? Absolutely, okay? Authority is not affected by distance. So, and the centurion understood that. He understood authority is not affected by distance. Therefore, he knew Jesus could heal at a distance. When Jesus issued the command to the infirmity, he had no doubt that it would obey him. Just like the centurion had no doubt that men under his authority would obey his commands. Do you get this? The person who truly understands authority will have no doubt that those things under our authority must and will obey our commands. If you really understand authority, then you will have no doubt that those things under your authority must and will obey your commands. What you say to them must be done. You have no doubt because you understand authority. And Jesus equated this authority, this unusual understanding of authority, with great faith. This is faith without a doubt. Faith without a doubt. This is mountain moving faith. The man had no doubt that his men would obey his commands. He had no doubt that Jesus could issue a command to the infirmity, which was under his authority. He had no doubt that the infirmity would obey because he understood authority. Are you with me here? Jesus equated this unusual understanding of authority with great faith. What was the result? Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. Now, now you know why we fail when we try to heal the sick, okay? Let's say uh, before this training, you had an opportunity in one of your small groups, okay? You had a Hindu or a Muslim come to your small group, okay? And he comes with a really, really bad headache, okay? And he says, oh, you know, if, if Jesus heals me, I'm going to believe in him tonight, okay? And you happen to have a full house. So you stand up and you walk over to this visitor You've got 20 eyes fastened on you. What's going on in your heart? Be truthful. Yeah, I hope God does this. If not, I'm embarrassed. Yes, okay. That's why we fail. It's that doubt. It's that fear of failure. That is precisely why we fail. When you minister to the person, your heart is going bump, 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 bump. What's going to happen if nothing happens? Boy, I'm making a fool out of myself. Help me, Jesus. Kashamba, papakanda. You know what I mean? That's when you really start speaking in tongues, okay? Why do you speak in tongues? To build up your most holy faith, which means you don't have enough faith to begin with. And that's why you fail. You get it? You see that? Is that, is that clicking now? You speak in tongues, that means you're trying to build up your most holy faith, which means you don't have faith enough to begin with, which means you're going to fail. When the demon hears you speaking in tongues, he's got you because he knows you lack faith. You want to speak in tongues, you do it well before you step into the ring. In church, at home, you speak in tongues, you pray, you fast. Once you step into the ring, step under the battlefield, uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy, you know, no more priestly actions. You are just firing away with your M4. Okay, you get that? Okay. Okay, so now you understand why we fail. It's that doubt, okay? It's that doubt. Fear of looking bad if nothing happens, okay? But now, if you understand authority, you should not have that 
fear and doubt. Correct? You have authority over disease and demons. Therefore, you have no doubt that they will obey your commands to go, especially when you're sharing the gospel. Because you understand authority. Whatever is under your authority must and will obey your commands. Diseases and demons are under your authority, especially when you're sharing the gospel to the lost. That is mountain moving faith or faith as a mustard seed. Okay? Mountain moving faith. Here we are. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart. I repeat, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. How do you get this kind of faith? By understanding authority. You will have no doubt in your heart when you speak to something which is under your authority. What I say must be done. Now, we understand the basis for our traditional way of ministering healing, which often involves prayer to God. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Speaking in tongues. Father, in Jesus' name, we rebuke this infirmity. Okay. Why do we say hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, when we're ministering to a sick person? Search your heart. What is the real reason why you are saying hallelujah, thank you, Jesus? You're nervous, doubt. You don't think you can get this done. So if you throw up a hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, maybe he'll come down and help you so that you don't embarrass yourself. It's a bribe. It's a bribe. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. It's a bribe. I've been there. I've done that too many times. I know why I did it. It's a bribe because I doubted I need his help. So hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. That means help. Okay. Okay. How about the singing and dancing? It can also be the same thing. Okay. It can be a bribe. Should we, is it proper to sing and dance before the Lord in order to get him to do something for us, in order to invoke his presence so that he'll heal the sick. Is that a pure motivation yeah. to worship God? No. We worship him because he is worthy, period. Because of what he has already done for us, because of who he is. We shouldn't worship and dance before him to get him to do something for us. That's not a holy, a pure motivation, okay? Yeah. But unfortunately, that's why we do that kind of stuff, to get him to do something for us, okay? not a pure motivation. Of course, I mentioned this already, speaking in tongues, when you're ministering to the sick, it's a dead giveaway. You haven't been trained, you don't know what you're doing, you lack faith, so you're speaking in tongues. If you don't know what else to do, speak in tongues, right? Isn't that kind of what we're taught? You don't know what else to do, speak in tongues, which means you, you're not trained, you don't know what to do, you're obviously gonna fail. You get it? See how it works? Speak in tongues well before. Okay. Take care of all the doubt well before you step into the ring. Okay. There's a time for the priestly. There's a time for the kingly. They are separate and distinct, should not be mixed together. Okay. How about Father in Jesus' name? Why do we say Father? Someone tell me. Why do we say Father? Jesus never did it, right? Why do we say Father in Jesus' name? Yeah, and so we want, and so we, we, we're going to drag the Father into this. So maybe the person will be healed if we drag God into it, right? It's sort of, yeah, that's the reason. Because of doubt. Father, meaning help, you know. Father in Jesus' name, you know, drag God into it. Maybe something will happen, right? That's doubt, okay? So, as wonderful as these things are, they're not scriptural. There's a time for speaking in tongues, prayer, and so forth. There's a time for that, but not when you are face to face with the enemy. That's the wrong time for these things. When you do them, it's a dead giveaway. It means you're not trained, you have fear, you have doubt. 
And when the enemy sees that, he's not leaving. Okay? He's not going. Disease, not going. Demon, not going. Okay? They can tell by the things you say and do. Okay? We minister in such a way because, our, because of our doubt that we can heal the sick as Jesus commands us. But when we truly understand the nature of authority, we will have no more doubt that infirmities and demons will submit to us. Amen. Amen. And what does it say? We have power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. And this is so that we can preach the kingdom of God to the lost. All right. All right, now, I think it's time for a demonstration. Let's actually do what we have been teaching. Let's heal the sick right now. Yeah. Okay? This is a very important part of this teaching. In fact, if you just teach the theory and without any demonstration, you haven't convinced anyone. Okay? The, the teaching sounds good, but does it really work? Let's see whether or not it really works. All right? Are you ready for this? Okay. okay. Now, some of you are going to be teaching this, and I want you to do it exactly the way I'm doing it. Okay. You're going to boldly do a demonstration in front of the people. Okay. When you teach this, you've got to do demonstrations, right? Isn't that what Jesus did? A lot of demonstrations? Okay. And we're going to do the same thing. Let's start with something simple, and then we'll go on to something more difficult, a bigger mountain. Uh, anyone have any arthritic pain? Any arthritic pain in the body? You... Uh, I think I like my, broken my foot, like fractured my foot. Oh. Oh, okay. You, you injured your foot and you may have fractured something. And so now when you walk, how do you feel? It hurts. It hurts. hurts really bad. Okay, so you're not able to run, right? No. No. Uh, can you walk without limping? Uh, I do, but it hurts. It hurts. Okay. All right. She hurt her, is it your ankle? Uh, it's just my foot. Your foot. Okay. All right. Do we have authority over this infirmity? Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're going to minister to her, correct? Do we expect her to be healed? Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, um, why don't you, uh, can we bring a chair over here? Bring a chair over here, okay? Put it right over here. All right, would you please come and, and sit over here? Now, we're going to do exactly what Jesus did, and normally Jesus would do two things. Number one would be the laying on of hands, okay? Where should we lay hands on her? Her foot, exactly where you feel the pain, okay? And uh, you can take off your sneaker too, okay? okay? I'm not wearing socks, I just You're took not, No, yeah. <laughs> okay, she just took a shower, so, so it, it's okay. Okay. Now, before we minister to her, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus can heal you right now? Yes. Yes, she does. Okay. Can you heal her? Yes or no? Say yes. Just, just say yes, okay? We're working on it, okay? Just say yes. There you go. Yes. Okay. Therefore, after we minister to you, we're going to ask you to get up and walk. Okay. And in fact, we want to see you running. But, but you start out with walking, okay? Okay. Okay? Right? Okay, we're not messing around here, okay? We're not messing around, okay? Okay. All right? Now, fortunately, I am the teacher, and teachers do not take the exams. Guess who takes the exams? Okay. One, two. Uh, Jesus sent them out two by two, and there they are. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Now, just stand over there, and, and, and I'm going to give you some instructions. Okay. So we're just going to do what Jesus did. Those two things. Uh, you're going to ask her. You're going to ask her where is the pain. Okay. And she will show you where the pain is later, and then you're going to put your hands there. And when you do that, eyes open or closed. Uh, open. Okay. Okay, yeah, you gotta, because you're gonna speaking to her foot. And so you gotta, when you talk to someone, do you close your eyes? No. So you're gonna be talking to her foot. So eyes open, you're gonna look at her foot. You're gonna be directing your commands directly to her foot. Okay, we're not praying, we're talking to the pain to, in the foot. Okay, and so when you lay hands on it, how about a little bit of squeezing and massaging? Should we throw that in, you think? <laughs> Just She's just kidding. She, she knows the truth, okay? So just lay hands on her. No, you don't need to squeeze. No funny business. Just let the power flow, okay? And, and I'm going to lead you in issuing the commands, okay? It will be very simple. It will be in the name of Jesus, be healed, pain, go, and stuff like that, okay? And you just repeat the commands after me, looking at her foot with no doubt. With no doubt. With absolute doubt. Assurance, you mean business. This is going to go because it's under my authority. You better go. Okay? I want that kind of attitude. Like a mother bear robbed of her cubs. You got that? That kind of... Okay? All right? Not, not to her, but toward the, the injury, toward the pain. Okay? Got that? So you have no doubt in your hearts. Absolutely. Good. All right? Even if you do have doubt, you don't say, I have doubt. You hide it, okay? You rebuke it. You step on it, okay? You do not confess it. Okay. Okay. Are we ready for this? Are you ready to be healed? Okay. Where is the pain and the injury? Okay, ladies. Okay, both of you, put a hand around that area. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, maybe up here a bit. Okay, is that about it? Yep. Okay, here we go. Look at the foot. Here we go. We're going to say this with no doubt, with mountain moving faith. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. I rebuke this pain. Rebuke this pain. Be, healed. Be healed. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Bone be healed. Bone be healed. Muscles, tendons healed. Restored. Restored. Now, now, in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. Pain, subside. pain subside. Go. Go. Leave. Leave. In Jesus' name. In Jesus, name. Jesus, heals you. Jesus heals you. Okay, ladies, you can let go. Now, stand up and walk. All the way better, okay? Can you, oh, look, she's jumping up and down, okay? Jumping up and down, praise the Lord. There, how about a little, how about running over here, okay? All right. You couldn't do that before, right? No, not like, I mean, I almost fell over the other night. Okay, any more pain? No, no more pain. Okay, all right. Now's the time for hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Now's the right time, right? Amen. Praise the Lord. Now, now, let me say something to you. We have found that the enemy is a sore loser. Okay. So you be alert. If this thing tries to come back, I want you to punch out his lights. You lay hands on it and say, no, you don't leave. You're not coming back. Get out in Jesus name. Do exactly the same thing. It will leave. Okay. So be alert. The enemy is a sore loser. Don't let him come back, okay? Now, ladies, was that difficult? Was that really, really, really hard? Did you have to be really, really spiritual? No. You're just, in the name of Jesus, be healed. That's all. As simple as that, okay? And this is generally how you minister to any kind of infirmity. It's the same thing, the exercise of authority, okay? Now, Let's do some other things. Um, let's see, who's, should we do heart conditions now?
Hmm. 9.20, okay, 10 minutes left. To do heart conditions, who's got a heart condition here with really bad symptoms? You're tired, you're breathless, you've got pain in your heart, can't pick up heavy objects. Who's got a heart condition and you want to be healed? Stand up and come to the front. Anyone going once, going twice? Do I hear ear infections? No. <laughs> All right. Okay. In that case, no heart conditions. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow, we are going to minister to people with heart conditions over your cell phones. Okay? Healing at a distance. Just like Jesus did to the centurion, we're going to minister healing to people with heart conditions over the cell phone. So tonight, you call those people up. If you know someone with a heart condition, call them up. Tell them, tomorrow, sometime during the day, morning or afternoon, I'm going to call you and minister healing to you for your heart condition. All right? Okay? Let's see what God does. His word is true. All right? You can do what Jesus did. Mark 11, 14, 12. All right? All right, now, who, uh, John 14, 12. Who's got some sort of pain and you need to be healed? You, you want to be set free from that pain. Okay, you come up. Go. Okay, brother. Anyone else? Let's do more than one at a time. Come up, sister. Just stand, stand uh, in a single line facing the people, brother. Anyone else? Come. Just come. If you have some sort of pain and you'd rather do without it. Okay, just come. Okay, yeah can be any kind of pain. You don't have to be dying or something. You know, Any kind of minor pain, if you'd rather do without it, just come up here. Okay, wonderful. All right. Now, Jesus sent them out two by two. So what I like is to have uh, two sisters to minister to each lady and two brothers to come to minister to him. So just come up here and stand in front of him and then await the instructions. Okay, so we need eight sisters. Could you spread apart a bit? Spread apart. Thank you. Uh, we need eight sisters and two brothers. Come. This is your chance to fire your weapons. Okay, come and stand in front of the person and await instructions. All right, do we have enough people? We need one more person. Two more women. Two more ladies. One more. All right. Okay. Uh, talk to the person and find out exactly where is the pain, the nature of the pain. Okay. Maybe he can sit down in that case. Okay. Okay. All right, now, sorry. now lay hands on the person wherever they have the pain, okay? Okay, eyes open, look at the pain, all right? Okay, are, are we ready now? Now we're gonna speak with authority with no doubt, like a mother bear robbed of her cups. We're gonna mean business now, mean and nasty. Here we go, in the name of Jesus. I rebuke this pain. You leave, you leave. Now. now. Any spirit of infirmity, go. Infirmity, go. Leave, her now. leave her now. In the name of Christ, the, of Christ. the Son of God, Son of God. Be, set be set free. Be healed. Be healed. No, more no more pain. Jesus heals you. Jesus heals you. All right, ask the person, how do you feel? Whoever is healed, we want your testimony. Who is healed? Uh, all right. Uh, all right. Everyone stay at the front. Uh, everyone stay at the front. Can you come over here, brother? We want you in the, in the camera. What happened? Um, I've been suffering from plantar fasciitis in my right heel for about three years now. And right now I have no pain. Hallelujah. 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 Praise the Lord. Are you healed? What happened? Uh, I've been having some pain in my lower back, above my hip, and it's done good. It's gone. Mm -hmm. It's gone. You had it before, and now it's gone. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow. 
I guess you must be healed. <laughs> what happened? I can hear my right ear now. She's been deaf in her right ear her whole life. She's been deaf in her right ear all her life. Now she can hear. Wow. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Were you healed? I had my lymph nodes were all swollen and hurting on the right side, and now they're gone. Not even swollen anymore. Really? The swelling went down. Woo. The swelling actually went down. Praise the Lord. Were, were you healed? Huh? Okay. Okay. You're not healed yet. All right. Okay. Now, those of you who are healed, you can go back to your seat. We're going to trend. We're going to. I want two of you to stay and help out. How about, um, okay, you stay. I want, I want you to, I want you to, can you come to the front here? Come over here, okay? Ladies, come over here. Come over here. Come over here, okay? Let's continue this, okay? Now, four out of five ain't bad, right? But we want five out of five, don't we? Don't we want five out of five? Did, did Jesus heal them all? Okay, as far as we know, all right, that's what we want to do, okay? Uh, what do you have now, sister? TMJ, real severe TMJ. Mm -hmm. We can hear it. We can hear it. Yeah, is, it pain, is it painful? It does, it causes headaches, and, and I sing, and you can't really do that. So. And right now you are feeling pain and discomfort, okay? Headaches, okay? A severe TMJ, all right? How many soldiers do we have? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that should be six. Oh, you... Oh, okay, all right. One, two, okay, let's do this, okay? Lay hands on her again, and, and you, you lay hands on, we need you too. Yes. Take, care of, take care of the sister at the end there, okay? All right, let's, let's take care of business here. Here we go. <laughs> there we go, in the eyes open, Eyes open, okay. Don't get too spiritual on me now. She closed her eyes. No closing eyes, okay. I, I, don't get spiritual, but we want you to be. Here we go. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke this TMJ. You unclean spirit, get out. Leave her now. In the name of Jesus, leave her. Pain subside. Pain subside. Right now. Right now. Jaw, go Jaw go back into place. Joint be restored. Joint be restored. Right, now. right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. No, more pain. no more pain. And I rebuke every tension. I rebuke the tension. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Now. Jawbone back into place. Jawbone back into place. Stay there. Stay there. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Okay, move your jaw now. Is it any better? The headaches are pretty bad for a little bit, but it's not, it's not healed. It's not even better. Okay. The headache is getting better. Okay. The, the mountain appears to be moving. Okay. How are you doing? Any change? No. No change. Feels, feels looser? Yeah, it wasn't, it's not as tight anymore. Okay, all right. So something is happening there. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some improvement, okay? It's a good sign. This thing is moving. It's moving toward the sea. What should we do? Again. Command it again, okay? All right, round three, ladies. <laughs> Knockout. <laughs> Knockout round. Here we go. In the name of Jesus. Lucille, here, you take over. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. you spirit of infirmity, leave, leave, in Jesus' name. Every spirit of tension, go, in Jesus' name. Be healed. Be set free. TMJ, go. In Jesus, name. In Jesus' name, the Lord heals you. The Lord, Lord sets you free. The Lord sets you free. Ask them. Okay. Ask them. But I'm not going to ask you to do anything. Just 
carbon, but only on the bottom, so that one has no carbon. So it's just a whole carbon dioxide. So and you're not feeling this much pain. This is her. No, this is her. Oh, Grayson. Okay, so it's improving. So what should we do? Let's do it one more time. Let's all of us stand up. See, this is the body of Christ. We do it together. The more, the better. The more hands, the better. Okay, let's, let's do it over. And don't think that this is the will of God for you to suffer like that. No. If you have sinned, then, you, then ask the Lord to forgive you, and it is done, and let's go for the healing. In the name of Jesus, In the name of Jesus. Be, totally be totally set free. In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. You, spirit you spirit of infirmity, you spirit of tension, spirit of tension. Go. go! In Jesus' name, In Jesus name. every stress, every stress. Go. go! In Jesus' name. In Jesus I speak, I speak peace to you. Now be set free. No longer have pain. No longer have pain. Jesus Christ heals you. Jaw be, be healed. Go back into place. Go back into place. Right now. Right now. In Jesus' name. Okay. Open your mouth and close it. I don't have any pain though. I mean, okay, she has no more pain. Yeah. I'm not feeling a headache and I'm side. feeling no looser, but I'm not, I'm still feeling popping. Okay. Okay. okay so you have no more pain, right? Some improvement. I the popping, but yeah. not the pain. Okay. okay. The so joint, it's joint. It's the joint. It's not jaw, but joint. Joint, yeah. yeah. The joint yeah. here. Yeah. Lose from the joint. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Any. Let's do it one more time. All right. Okay. Okay, lay hands. It's not time to just retreat. They, they, they're moving, okay? <laughs> the Lord forgives you of your sin. Be healed. Be set free. The Lord set you free. Be healed. Join, be healed. Every joint now go back into your place. Mouth open and close properly. Be healed. Be made whole. In Jesus' name. Open it and close it. Now, what I don't want you to, yeah, what I don't want you to have is the guilt and the condemnation. There is no condemnation. There's no guilt. Come back tomorrow. We'll do it again. And you never know, even tonight. Bang. Okay? Yes. All right. Praise the Lord. And you do have improvement, right? I, the headache is, is the feels like it's lifting. So. Okay. Okay. How about you? Oh, it feels like, I mean, I have no tension or pain, but I still have the popping, but it's like normal. It's not like it's usually it catches on this side, like over the and will go over like fluid in your joint. It's much better. Sometimes it can be inflammation too there. Okay. So, so you're much better. Praise the Lord. Much better. Okay. Praise the Lord. And, and, and you come back tomorrow. We'll minister again. Okay. We're going to continue moving this mountain. Yes. Okay. Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, praise the Lord. Please be seated, and then we'll, we'll close. Uh, so, to those of you who, who have been healed, okay, I want you to be alert. Don't let this thing come back. You got that? Don't let it come back. Enemy is a sore loser. Don't let it come back. It tries to come back. Rebuke it in Jesus' name with authority. All right? Okay. <laughs> You, you were deaf since birth in that ear? No. Not fully. Not fully. But, like, I've never talked on the phone on this side. Okay. Like, you know, uh-huh. It's good. And it's good now. Woo! It's good. Praise the Lord. Okay. Amen. Yes. And, you know, I believe that these things are a result of all the prayer and fasting you have been doing. All the prayer and fasting that you have been doing have resulted in this. Once you apply 
the authority. So the prayer and fasting have prepared you to do the things you are doing today, to use this power and authority with no doubt. All right, praise the Lord. Now, this is just session one that we have had this evening. Tomorrow we start session two, all right? So we encourage you to come. I know tomorrow, Saturday, you got things to do, but um, nothing to do, okay? But if you do have things to do, you might want to skip those things and come to get the entire training, all right? Because there's still a lot of stuff that we haven't gone over. We're going to go deeper into mountain moving faith. We're going to go into the book of Acts. We're going to study James chapter 5 about praying over. We're going to study uh, Peter stepping out of the boat and sinking and stuff like that. Okay, we're going to study a lot of good stuff. So I encourage you to come back tomorrow. Is it 9 o'clock, brother? Yeah, 9 o'clock, okay? 8 o'clock prayer and 9 o'clock we start with this, okay? And remember the people with heart disease, tell them we're going to minister to them at a distance over the telephone, okay? That they should be ready, they should have their cell phones with them morning and afternoon, okay? Tomorrow, uh, it'll be 9 to 11 and 1 to 3, okay? Four hours tomorrow, okay? So please come back tomorrow and people who need healing and ask them to come tomorrow. 9, 11, 1 to 3. Uh, we need people to heal. <laughs> Amen? We need people to heal. Okay? To prepare you for your mission trips. Uh, to prepare you to reach out to the Buddhists and the Muslims and the Hindus right in this city. Amen? Okay. Praise the Lord. Let's close in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, you are so gracious, Lord. You have done all of these things, Lord, in our midst. We thank you, Lord, for how gracious you have been, Lord. You have enabled your servants here to pray and fast, Lord, for days and days and days, Lord. And you have been gracious tonight, Lord, to pour out your spirit, releasing your power and authority in such a wonderful way. We are encouraged, Lord. And Lord, we know that your word is true. And tonight you have demonstrated it, Lord with miraculous healings. So, Father, we ask you, Lord, to water the seed that has been planted in our hearts, Lord, because we want this seed, Lord, to bear much fruit, Lord, 30, 60, 100 times what was sown, Lord. We want to use this, Lord, to win the lost in this city and on mission trips, Father. So cause the seed that has been planted, Lord, to bear much fruit, Lord. Lord, make, our, make the soil in our hearts fertile so that this seed can grow and grow, and grow, Lord, and bear much fruit for you. Thank you, Lord, again, for what you have done tonight. Thank you for your precious word, Lord. And thank you, Father, that you have called us to be your children and your disciples and your witnesses during these last days. And Father, we will do our part to fulfill the great commission, Lord. We will not fail you, Lord. We will not fail you, Lord, but we will get the job done as you have commanded us to make disciples, to heal the sick, and to proclaim the kingdom of God. We will get the job done, Father, and we will not fail because you are with us and you have given us this power and authority and given us your word. We thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen, amen. amen.